cold weather, humidity swings, bad filament, print failures always seem to hit you when you least expect it. But the truth is, most failures can be prevented with just a few simple slicer tweaks that a lot of people overlook. What's going on everyone? Welcome back to my channel. My name is Nick. Today, I'm gonna to be showing you a handful of slicer settings that can instantly make your prints much more reliable. Things like smarter speed adjustments, better bed adhesion tricks, support improvements, and more. These are small little changes that can make a massive difference. And real quick, if you've been enjoying these videos and wanna see more, please drop a comment down below. It helps the channel get pushed out to a lot more people and it really helps support the channel. I appreciate each and every one of you that take that moment to do that. Real quick, I put together a one page cheat sheet that goes over all of these settings that you can download and use as a simple checklist whenever you're starting a new print or troubleshooting print issues. The link will be down below. All right, let's go ahead and start with something that causes more failures than people realize, and that's layer shifting. A lot of times when a print randomly shifts to the side or the layers suddenly stop lining up, people jump straight to blaming belts or hardware. But in reality, many times it's a speed issue. Even though our printers can run at extremely fast speeds, that doesn't mean that every single model should be printing at those speeds. One of the simplest fixes is to lower your outer wall speed and your small perimeter speed by around 20 to 25%. That reduction gives the printer more time to accurately lay down material and it reduces the momentum the tool head carries in tight corners. By slowing it down just a bit, you're basically giving your printer breathing room to keep everything aligned. Another thing that people overlook is how speed affects vibration. Even if your machine is solid, a fast moving tool head creates vibrations inside the model itself. On tall or narrow prints, these vibrations add up and top sections start to sway. And once it sways, your layers start going down slightly off center. That's when you see the classic staircase shift happening. So if you're running into layer shifts, inconsistent walls, weird ringing, or a print that suddenly leans halfway through, Backing off your speed is honestly one of the best low effort fixes that you can make. It's just a small tweak that can save your print before it fails. But slowing down the entire print isn't always necessary. Sometimes a print only becomes unstable later in the print job, especially once it gets tall. That's where the slowdown by height setting becomes incredibly useful. Because instead of slowing down everything, you can target only a part of your print that needs extra stability. So let's move into that next. Now let's talk about a setting that doesn't get nearly enough attention because it's a fairly new feature, and that's slow down by height. This one is especially useful for prints that start off perfectly fine, then suddenly fail halfway through or near the top, usually from wobbling, vibration, or the nozzle knocking the model over. The thing about tall or narrow prints is that the first few centimeters are usually solid and stable because there's a lot of surface area holding everything down. But once that print starts gaining height, the leverage on the base increases. Every little movement of the tool head, every acceleration change, even the fans kicking on can introduce tiny amounts of sway at the top of the model. Individually, those movements don't seem like much, but as a print gets taller, they stack up. And once the model starts vibrating, your layers stop lining up. You might see slight layer inconsistencies, random blobs, or in some cases, the entire top section can shift and completely fail. This is where slow down by height becomes such a powerful tool. This option lets you control how fast a printer moves as a print gets taller. You choose a starting height and then an ending height. Between those two heights, the printer will slowly change its speed and acceleration. For example, the printer can start faster near the bottom of the print and gradually get slower as it moves upward or the other way around. The change happens smoothly as the height increases, not all at once. In short, the printer speed adjusts based on how tall the print is. Let's go ahead and take this Dragon Bus print for an example. And the base is made out of rock and very asymmetrical and rugged. So printing this section at full speed is perfectly fine as any minor imperfections will only add to the rock texture. But once the Dragon Bus starts and gets taller, we wanna get as much detail and have a lot more quality in our print. So if we turn on slow down by height, you will see some very odd arbitrary numbers. Let's just ignore these as these defaults aren't even correct to start with. Let's say we want to slow our printer down as it gets higher on the print and starts at the bust. If I slice the model real quick and use this layer widget here on the side, I can see that at millimeter height 38 is a good place to start our slowdown. So we will add that as our starting height. Now remember, the widget gives you both layers and Z height. The top number is the layers and the bottom is the height in millimeters. 
Let's also note the total print time so that we can have a comparison because this setting will increase our print time. And it looks like we have a print time of about nine and a half hours. Now you may or may not know this, but up here in the process presets, we have standard settings and higher quality settings. One of the differences between those preset templates are adjustments in speed. The standard settings outer wall is 200. Sparse infill speed is 270 and the acceleration is 10,000. Now, if we look at the high quality settings, you will see the speed changes to 60, 200, and 4,000 for acceleration. So this can kind of give us a guideline on what we can use for our speed at our starting height. So let's go with a speed of 250 and an acceleration of 6,000. That means we'll adjust our speed to this amount as soon as a printer reaches 38 millimeters on the z-axis of our model. Now remember, this is millimeters in the height, not the layer height. Now the next thing we need to do is set our ending height. I know this model is 250 millimeters tall, so I will set it to 250. Next, we set our ending speed at that height of the print. I think if we adjust it to half the speed or 50%, that should be good enough. So half of 250 is 125. Now for the acceleration, we should be a little more aggressive on that adjustment. Acceleration is a major cause for print issues, especially for models that are getting taller. So let's adjust our acceleration down to just 1000. Now that we have our settings dialed in, let's slice it one more time to see the print time difference. And as you can see, we get a little over 12 hours. So we are roughly increasing the print by about two and a half hours or so. So when do we use the slow down by height feature? Well, in general, slowing down your printer will give you cleaner prints. But I think this feature is especially important for printers like the A1 or for prints that have minimal surface area on the build plate, or even for prints that are very tall. A Core XY printer such as the H or P series can better handle taller prints, but they can also give you better results by using this feature. Now, if time is of the essence for your print, then maybe this feature isn't a good option. But if you own multiple printers and never have them all running, why not take advantage of this new feature, give yourself an opportunity to combat print fails and have some cleaner prints. Which also brings up another point. Just because I'm slowing this particular Dragon Bus down, using this feature does not mean it will print with a higher quality than if I had turned it off. But for a tall, skinny print, Having this feature turned on can mean the difference of a successful print or a failed print. All right, the next thing that we need to talk about is one of those most underrated tools in the slicer, and that's modifier meshes. If you're not using modifiers, you're missing out on one of the most powerful ways to reduce failures and dial in a model without affecting the entire print. A modifier mesh basically lets you apply custom settings to a very specific area of your print almost like adding a mini profile inside your main profile. This is really helpful when the majority of the print is solid, but you have one weak point that keeps causing issues. For example, maybe you're printing a part with thin vertical tabs or clips. Those thin features tend to fail because they don't have enough infill or because the printer is moving too fast on those areas. With a modifier mesh, you can drop a simple cube or a cylinder over just that section and change the settings inside that region only. You can slow down that area, you can increase the number of walls, you can boost infill density, you can even change the cooling and temperature if needed, all without affecting the rest of the model. Just this past weekend, I was working on a project for a huge barn door I built. It closes off our entire bathroom, and in the middle of the night, when we walk past it, the breeze would make the door tap the wall. So I designed a print guide to hold the door in place and prevent that swaying movement. It also keeps the door lined up when opening and closing it. In that design, I used a modifier on one specific section to increase the infill because I felt that that area might eventually break if it wasn't reinforced. All I did was drop in a modifier cube, resized it, moved it into place, and then changed the infill setting just inside that region. Problem solved. Now, even with modifiers, some models don't even have enough surface area touching the bed, especially tall or narrow prints. And when that first layer isn't secure, everything above is also at risk. So let's move into one of the simplest but most effective tools for improving bed adhesion, brims. A brim is one of those tools that people tend to overlook because it feels like an old school printing trick. But the reality is it solves a ton of issues related to first layer adhesion. The first layer adhesion is a foundation for your entire print. If the base isn't locked down, every millimeter above is at risk. 
Brims are especially useful for models with small contact patches, tall, narrow parts, figures, thin walls, or anything with sharp corners that like to lift. When a printer starts laying down those early layers, the plastic is expanding and contracting as it cools. Corners tend to curl upward, and even the slightest lift can cause the nozzle to hit that part. A brim adds a wide skirt of material around the model, dramatically increasing the surface area on the build plate. This extra footprint holds down the corners and prevents that lifting from ever starting. If you'd like a more in-depth explanation of any of these features, I'll link to the videos I've already published that go into much more detail. You can find those in the description down below. Now let's talk about something even more targeted, brim ears. Brim ears are basically small, intentionally placed brims that only attach to certain parts of the model, typically corners or areas that are prone to warping. Instead of adding a full brim around the entire print, you can place just a few strategic pads where lifting is most likely to occur. This solves a couple of problems. You get the adhesion boost exactly where you need it, you keep cleanup to a minimum, you save material, and you don't add any unnecessary brim around the edges that don't need it. Enabling brim ears is a great way to get that adhesion insurance without committing to a full brim, and it keeps your workflow cleaner and faster. Textured plates, smooth plates, high-speed settings, it doesn't matter. If your first layer doesn't stay locked down, nothing above it has a chance. Whether you use a full brim or just brim ears, the goal is the same. Keep your print firmly planted until it's structurally strong enough to support itself. That's why next we're going to look at support expansion. Now brim keeps the model firmly planted onto the build plate, but what about the parts of your model that rely on supports? Supports need their own kind of adhesion to stay stable during your prints. Support expansion is one of the most important tools for strengthening your supports, and it works very similar to how a brim strengthens your first layer. When supports don't have enough surface area, touching the build plate, they can wiggle, shift, or completely fall during printing. And just like a brim gives your model more contact with the bed, support expansion gives your supports more contact with the bed. Support expansion is measured in millimeters. Zero means no expansion. Eight millimeters means your supports will grow outward by eight millimeters. And 10 or more creates a wide solid attachment area for heavy or large prints. By increasing that value, you're essentially giving your support a wider footprint. Just like adding a brim underneath a tall print. This helps prevent support wobble and ensures they stay firmly connected throughout the entire job. Here's how I personally use it. For medium to moderately tall prints, I usually set my support expansion to 8mm. This gives the support enough stability to handle most overhangs without adding much more of the print time. For larger models, like helmets or big cosplay pieces, I go with 10mm or more. At that scale, supports carry a lot more weight. So giving them a wider attachment area makes a huge difference in preventing sagging and collapse. These changes accomplish several things. The supports attach to the build plate with a much stronger bond. Tall supports become far more rigid and less likely to shift or vibrate. You get that peace of mind that you won't be losing a support during your print time. All right, so the last thing that I wanna cover is infill because what you choose for the inside of your print has a huge impact on the overall strength, vibration resistance, and your chances of seeing cracks or structural failures. A lot of people think that infill is just about choosing a percentage, but the pattern itself is just as important. Different infill patterns behave in completely different ways during printing, and those differences show up in part strength, flexibility, and even print stability. Let's go ahead and start with one of my personal favorites, triangles. Triangle infill is fast, efficient, and very strong because the pattern creates a rigid, interlocking geometry and it resists bending and handles load really well, especially for mechanical parts. It's a great balance between speed and strength, which is why I use it often. If I'm printing something functional, brackets, hinges, tool holders, anything that needs rigidity, Triangle Infill performs really well without adding unnecessary print time. Then you have the Grid Infill. This is extremely fast, but they don't distribute stress evenly. When a model flexes or vibrates, the grid pattern can create a weak point where the infill aligns with the model's outer walls. These infills are great for drafts, quick prototypes, or decorative prints where the strength isn't the main concern. Cubic patterns are also fairly strong and distribute weight better than grid, but they can still print faster than gyroid. They're a nice middle ground, strong in multiple directions, but not as smooth structurally as gyroid. Now let's talk about the gyroid pattern and why it's such a powerful option for preventing failures. Gyroid infill creates a continuous wavy internal structure that has no directional weakness. 
It doesn't matter how the part is loaded or twisted, the stresses get spread out evenly through the entire model. This makes Gyroid excellent for tall prints that need internal stability, parts that may vibrate or flex, anything with thin walls, and models where cracking along layer lines is a concern. Gyroid prints slower than triangles, grid, or any other line pattern because the pattern is more complex and involves continuously curved patterns instead of straight lines. So you're trading off speed for internal stability. For functional strength and speed, triangles are fantastic, and that's why I personally use them so often. But when your goal is failure prevention, especially for prints that are tall, have thin walls, or are prone to vibration, gyroid is hard to beat. All right, that's going to wrap up today's video. These are all small settings, but when you stack them together, they make a huge difference in preventing failures and keep your prints consistent. And the best part is none of this requires any special hardware. I also put together a one page cheat sheet. It's all these settings. It's an easy way to run through a quick checklist before sending an important model to the printer. And that link will be down below. And if you found this video helpful, do me a huge favor, drop a comment down below, even if it's a quick, I'm liking these videos, keep them coming. It goes a long way and really helps the channel out. And while you're at it, go ahead, hit that like button if you haven't already. I've got a lot more tutorials on the way. So if you're enjoying this kind of content, make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss any of the next videos. Thanks again for watching. Again, my name is Nick. I hope you're having a great day. And as always, happy printing.